Thank you for that very fine introduction. Um, I've been in, in Poland several times, but this is my first trip to the beautiful city of Krakow. And I'm very excited to be a part of the, what is clearly a thriving intellectual community here at Jagiellonian University. I realize that a number of you probably do not know much about Cash and have probably not read his book, The Mind of the South. As a way of a quick introduction, I just want to say that Cash, uh, during the 1930s, was a journalist living in Charlotte, North Carolina, and writing for the Charlotte News. And in 1941, he published one of the most important books on Southern culture that was written in the 20th century, The Mind of the South. Before I uh, start my paper, I want to, to mention tell you about a little anecdote that happened to me yesterday. I hope you'll bear with me because what happened was very important to me. Yesterday, Mikhail took me and another American university to one of the gardens on campus. Passing through the gate, I felt an immediate sense of calm and tranquility. Only, only when we were about to leave did Mikhail tell us that this garden, the professor's garden, was a memorial to the professors at Jagiellonian University who on November 6, 1939, assembled in a hall on campus, thinking they were attending a meeting on the future of the university under Nazi occupation. The professors were summarily arrested by the Nazis and were soon on their way to the concentration camps. Many did not survive. I mention this for several reasons, actually two reasons. First, what happened to the professors bears some relevance to W.J. Cash. Like the professors, Cash believed in the freedom of thought and inquiry in the face of the Nazi threat. While Cash was not killed by the Nazis, he feared that he would be. The second reason I mention my visit to the garden is more personal. As you can probably surmise from my name, Brinkmeyer, I come from German ancestry from my father's side. When I was a boy, and I first read about the Holocaust and the atrocities of the Nazis, I felt somehow implicated. Ever since then, with regard to the Nazis, I have felt appalled as a human, ashamed as an individual. I felt that yesterday. I feel that today. I stand here before you in a room, not all that far from the one that 105 professors and 33 lecturers from this university were seized and taken away by the Nazis. I dedicate this talk to their memory. With the introduction to her 1939 collection of journalism, Let the Record Speak, most of which comments on the rise of fascism and Nazism during the 1930s and the responses, or not, by non-fascist countries, Dorothy Thompson writes that the only good that can accrue to us from fascism is its challenge for us to reconsider, point by point, all that we are supposed to live by. It forces us to admit that democracy is very sick, for had it been healthy, courageous, and strong, fascism would have died in the bud. Besides an apt description of her own response to fascism, Thompson's words here also speak tellingly about the response by one of her regular and avid readers, W.J. Cash, not only in his editorials and reviews in the Charlotte News, but also in his 1941 masterwork, The Mind of the South. To argue that Cash's interpretation of Southern culture in this book was crucially shaped by international politics is one that I've already made in my book, The Fourth Ghost, and one that Richard King, one of Cash's most important critics, has put forth in his excellent essay, Cash and the Crisis of Political Modernity. Any reader of Mind of the South would do well to keep in mind the questions that King suggests Cash was exploring in his interpretation of Southern history. These are those questions. What are the possibilities and perversions of democratic politics? What is the nature of political authority and consent? And encompassing these concerns, how did the political culture of the West produce fascism, Nazism, Stalinism, in some totalitarianism, and make it, not the democratic politics and cultural freedom, appear the wave of the future in the 1930s, the wave of the future as the 1930s accelerated towards disaster. <laughs> 
What I want to do today is to extend my own argument as well as King's by looking at Cash, Cash's obsession with Adolf Hitler and how that may have influenced his overall conception of Southern culture and history. To do, to do that, I want first to compare Cash's interpretation of, his, of Southern culture as seen in two works of the same name, his 1929 essay, The Mind of the South, and his 1941 book. The two works share a similar overarching argument concerning the continuity of Southern history. That is, that the fundamentals of Southern culture and identity have changed very little from the time of the Old South, despite the momentous challenges, the momentous social changes wrought by the Civil War, Reconstruction, and, moder and modernity. Or put another way, Cash argued that the South has always valued place over time. Nonetheless, there are some striking differences between the essay and the book in their representation of this con continuity. Differences whose origins, I believe, lie in Cash's reading of Mein Kampf and more generally his fascination with Hitler. During the 1930s, Cash obsessively followed news and political commentary on the growing crisis in Europe. And as I hope to show, the South began to look to him very different when he set it aside when he said it alongside Nazi Germany. Cash's 1929 essay on the continuity of the Southern mind is much less forbidding in tone than the 1941 book. And when Cash talks about mind, he's, he's talking primarily about kind of a collective, unconscious, collective unconscious. And he described it as, quote, a fairly definite mental pattern associated with a fairly definite social pattern a complex of established relationships and habits and th of thoughts, sentiments and prejudices, standards and values, and association of ideas. His argument on the Southern mind's resistance to change focuses largely on cotton mill workers, this is, I'm talking about the essay, who in moving from the factory were thrust into a new economic system, but who nonetheless followed the daily rhythms of life in the countryside. By holding unthinkingly to traditional patterns, Cash argued that mill workers blinded themselves to the realities of their mechanized and exploited condition. Shaping the lives of the southern mill worker are the traits that Cash would later enumerate more fully in this book. He is individualistic, romantic, anti-intellectual, and Calvinistic. In other words, he is a hell of a fellow more concerned with dogs, guns, whiskey, and horses than with the anything smacking of the mind and particularly critical inquiry. Thinking involves unpleasant realities, unsavory conclusions, Cash writes, and happily there is no need for it. Since everything is arranged by God, there is nothing to think about. As Cash observes in this essay, many of the mill workers were, had come down from the, from the North Carolina mountains. And he has a lot of fun presenting the comic clash between the prim primitive mountaineers and the urbane city dwellers. As when he observes that the mill workers, rather than taking daily showers, continue to take once a week baths on Saturday night in old tin tubs. And when he writes that the mill workers enjoy going on strike because they see it as a Roman holiday, fun days for fisticuffs and mayhem. In part because he draws so heavily on hillbilly stereotypes, Cash does not foreground black-white relations in his essay as he does later in the book. The southern mountains have by and large and still are large, overwhelmingly white. There are very few black people in the, in the Southern mountains. About as far as Cash goes in explaining Southern racism is, asser, is his assertion that the white Southerner has a passion for going to war and is always looking for, quote, ravening, ravening monsters to fight against. And so, Cash observes, witness his perpetual sweat about the nigger. Significant, too, in contrast to the later book is the fact that the essay lacks any international political context any nod toward the turmoil of contemporary Europe for contextualizing issues confronting the South in the late 1920s with those broadly facing Western society, including the rise, for instance, of, the, of fascist Italy. 
When Cash does look to Europe, it's almost exclusively to traditions of long ago, as when he notes Southerners' ongoing fascination with the chivalric ideal and a few European writers, including Scott, Dumas, and Dickens, whose work allows Southerners to escape into the enchantments of romance and heritage, what Mark Twain identified as the South's Walter Scott disease. Significant as well in terms of the differences between the essay and the book is the only explanation Cass provides for Southerners' resistance to change is their unquestioned loyalty to Southern traditionalism. There's no mention, for instance, of the plantation system and the continuous rolling back of, the Southern, of Southern culture into frontier conditions, key concepts that Cash would later develop in his book to explain Southern continuity and the stunted, jejun nature of Southern culture. Southerners are shown to be less prisoners of any social authoritarianism than of their own simple-minded refusal to think critically about themselves and their society. Cash's analysis of Southern recalcitrance to change rarely extends beyond providing humorous examples of Southern mindlessness, as when he asserts that Southerners join groups such as the Ku Klux Klan and the Patriotic Order of Sons of America because membership provides them opportunities for dressing up and enjoying swashbuckling adventure. The only control, cultural controlling force Cass identifies is Southern fundamentalism with its belief that change is better left to the hands of God to, than to the hands of men. In words that in hindsight look ominously forward to his 1941 book, Cash at one point identifies the South as, quote, a closed, ordered world. But the essay is actually less about a lockdown society than about lockdown individuals who, in their refusal to think critically, are their own jailers. Cash began work on revising his essay into a book sometime in the early 1930s. In his 1932 application for a Guggenheim application to write a book about the writer Lafcadio Hearn, Cash said that he had completed about 60,000 words of his revision of the mind of the South and that he planned to have the completed manuscript to Knopf, his publisher, in 1933. At some point in the next year or so, however, Cash destroyed this manuscript. In another Guggenheim application, this one from 1936, Cash described the problems he had come to have with his first draft. But I tried to write too rapidly. I discovered that I knew a great deal less about the South than I thought I knew. And above all, I grew to dislike the attitude which I had begun. When it was complete, I looked at it and found, while it seemed to me to contain some excellent ideas and some passages of good writing, it was neither reasonably fair nor organized into a continuous piece. Cash did not elaborate here or elsewhere what attitude he had grown to dislike, but perhaps his proposed project for the Guggenheim provides a clue. He wanted to write a novel about the struggle of two Carolina farm families as their hometown hamlet evolved into a factory town. And he wanted to write the novel while living in Europe, specifically in Berlin and Munich. Though he added that if war broke out, England would be acceptable. Why Nazi Germany, a nation he deeply feared? Why Munich, the birthplace and stronghold of the Nazi party? Why Berlin, the seat of Nazi power? Why, putting it more specifically, would, would Cash want to write a novel about the North Carolina Piedmont while living in a country whose leadership he believed was plunging it and Western civilization into the abyss. I named Germany for a double reason, he wrote in his application. I have a strong interest, strong personal interest in this culture. And in the second place, I have a particular interest in the Nazi regime and the movement as a historical phenomenon and want an opportunity to observe it at close range. What Cash doesn't say here, but which nonetheless I think is another and perhaps the crucial reason for his desire to go to Nazi Germany, is, by, is that by 1936 he already knew that his work on the mind of the South, which he was now working on again, that his fascination with the Nazi regime was shaping his understanding of the South. 
and that being in Germany would enrich that understanding, and ultimately his novel, and perhaps ultimately also the mind of the South, since Cash no doubt was aware, given all his other missed deadlines, spring 1937 was his new de date for completion, that he might still be working on it during the year he hoped to be in Germany with his Guggenheim Fellowship. While it's impossible to pinpoint exactly when Cash became fascinated with Hitler and the Nazis, it was almost certainly 1933, when Hitler came to power and when the first English translation of Mein Kampf in a heavily abridged form was published in the United States and England. Cash at some point, again in all likelihood 1933, purchased Mein Kampf and began poring over and heavily annotating his copy. In the coming years, in his editorials on international affairs for the Charlotte News, Cash often asserted that to understand Hitler's plans and intentions, must, everyone must read Mein Kampf, rather than listening to Nazi propaganda and to Nazi appeasers, whom Cash detested and repeatedly attacked in his columns. Mein Kampf, Cash declared in an editorial from 1939, is, quote, plainly the most important political document of the century adding that while the whole frame of the book hurts in the pit of the democratic stomach, it is virtually required reading for intelligent people. Even those who hate him must read him, must read his story, and hate him the worst. As Europe crept toward and into war, Cash's concerns about Hitler became progressively obsessive, as seen not only in his journalism, but also in his behavior in the newsroom. In a memorable passage, Cash's biographer, Bruce Clayton, describes his flare-ups when Hitler's name was mentioned in news wires or came up in conversation. This is Clayton, and this is a remarkable passage. By late 1939, with his fears fixated on Hitler, the merest mention of the dictator's name caused Cash's anger to flare. He would begin by rubbing his forehead vigorously. I'm tempted to try to act all this out, but I can't. He would begin by rubbing his head vigorously and squinting his eyes. Then he would start pacing, muttering about Hitler's villainy. Then his voice would rise, and he flailed his arms in denunciation. When reading something disturbing about the international scene, he would at first sit staring at the newspaper or magazine. Then he would jump up, fling the paper on the floor, and grind it under his heel. Hitler was a demon, a filthy monster. Cash would stand staring at the giant wall map in the newsroom, carefully and silently tracing Hitler's movements. Then he would begin to scream epithets. Hitler was a madman, a maniac, a Ku Kluxer, white trash. Cash's screams could be heard throughout the newsroom and beyond. By identifying Hitler as a Ku Kluxer, white trash, Cass, of course, was clearly placing Nazi Germany alongside the South, not necessarily equating them, but using what he saw from one to understand the other. I'm going to come back to this point in a bit, because I believe this dual perspective, focusing simultaneously on Nazi Germany and the American South, is crucial for understanding Cash's The Mind of the South. But I first want to step back to the early, early and mid-1930s when Cash was reading Mein Kampf and starting over on his second attempt as a, at, with his book. As I've said before, I believe Cash's close reading of Mein Kampf provided him with a new perspective and a new context for understanding Southern culture and history, an understanding that profoundly shaped his analysis. Mein Kampf, to begin with, gave Cash insight for understanding Southern nationalism. In his discussions of Germans living in Austria, Hitler asserts that German Austrians, and of course that included his, Hitler himself, face a choice between two nationalisms, dynastic patriotism, loyalty to the ha House of Habsburg, and what he called folkish nationalism, loyalty to one's people, in this case, the Germans. Since for Hitler, the most exalted aim of human existence is the pre preservation of one's people, or one's race, or one's species, as he sometimes called it, and not the preservation of a state, that is a government, Hitler endorses with a vengeance, folkish nationalism. 
It is probably no coincidence that the night newspaper the Nazis purchased in Munich to make their own was the Völkischer Beobachter, and they kept its name, which typically translates into, which typically has been translated into as National Observer. But the word Völkisch also translates into English as folkish or ethnic, and carries these connotations even when translated as national. It was precisely this ethnic nationalism that was endorsed by the Nazis, even though the leaders deliberately chose not to include Folkish in their party name. As Hitler explains, they didn't want the Nazi party to, to be confused with antiquarians and traditional folk movements, though of course Hitler was at the same time appealing to these groups for support. Whether he deliberately drew from Hitler's observations, Cash focuses on the mind of the South less on Confederate nationalism, that is a version of Hitler's dynastic nationalism, than on the ethnic nationalism that he sees binding together all Southern whites. Cash designates this ethnic nationalism as the proto-Dorian bond. At first, at least at first glance, the pro term proto-Dorian seems downright strange, if not incongruous. But in terms of Hitler's ethnic nationalism, proto-Dorian is not incongruous at all, as it makes reference to the ethnic bond that connected the Dorians and their various states against the other ethnicities of ancient Greece. Perhaps Cash, Cash designates the bond as proto because he sees it for most white Southerners, as much somatic as conscious, its most visible expression found in the racist rhetoric of Southern demigods, such as Pitchfork, Ben Tillman, Cole Bleas, and Huey Long. Southern demigods, I should add, not surprisingly, appear much more dangerous in the 1941 text than in the 1929 ex essay, as the rise of Nazi and fascist dictatorships together with the outbreak of the war on the continent, cast a long, dark shadow on demo, on the, over the demagogue's firebrand politics. Not insignificantly, Cash opens the mind of the South with an extensive discussion of the common bloodlines that racially linked colonial settlers in the South, precisely the bloodlines that would later cement the proto-Dorian bond. The proto-Dorian bond united whites against blacks in the South, not unlike the way that Hitler's Aryanism united Germans against the Jews. Jews could never become Germans, that is, ethnic Germans, and thus full citizens of the German national state, Hitler asserted, because they were of a different race, their veins carrying a different blood. As we all know, and particularly standing here in Krakow, the ideal of maintaining Aryan bloodlines free from Jewish pollution was tantamount for Hitler, leading to terrifying results. Likewise, white Southerners in their proto-Dorianism believed that blacks were a separate race and could never be white, both in terms of ethnic identity as well as holding full civil and political rights. Aside from the racist rants of the demagogues, one of the most forthright assertions of this type of thinking is found in William Alexander's memoir, Lanterns on the Levee, which was published in the same year as Mind of the South. Percy railed against the idea that the inferiority of black blood should be ignored in determining the status of blacks in the South. This is Percy. I wonder when the obvious connection between the innards and the outards of redheads is generally conceded, but it is doubted in people of slant eyes and yellow skins and flatly denied in people of kinky hair and black skins. Someone's always drawn the color line. Now they won't let a Negro's interior be as an individual as his exterior. I am told there is no relation from what you see of him and what there is of him. The only difference is a sort of hallucination in the eye of beholder. He is a white man inside. This is something that Percy, as well as many white Southerners of his day, could never accept. For Cash, the racial essentialism of the proto-Dorian bond undergirded the white South's obsessive concern for racial purity, manifested most discernibly in what Cash identified as the cult of Southern womanhood and the Southern rape complex 
As Cash explains, the whites out during Reconstruction came to identify the white woman, quote, with the very notion of the South itself, so that any effort by blacks to better themselves socially and economically was seen by whites as nothing less than, quote, an attack on the Southern woman that was as degrading as rape itself. It all came down to blood and bloodlines, as Cash declares. In the Southerners' concern for the taboo on the, wi of the, wi on the white woman, there was a final concern for the right of their sons in the legitimate line, through all the generations to come, to be born of the great white heritage. Put simply, white Southerners feared that black equality would lead to the pollution of white blood. Besides working to restrict blacks from full citizenship, Cash saw the proto-Dorian bond as ultimately restricting whites from free expression. Since it's at its extreme, it enforced a rigid conformity, not unlike that of the modern totalitarian state. Hitler may have celebrated such elaborate control, but not Cash. Unlike in his 1929 essay, Cash in his 1941 book depicts white Southerners living in a tightly controlled society whose model of restraint and authority extends back to the plantation with its systematic enslavement of blacks and its marginalization of poor whites. The Cash had come to this position by 1936 is absolutely clear. As the excerpt from his book, from his book manuscript, it was published that year in Lillian Smith and Paula Snelling's journal, focuses on Southern intolerance and the smothering of, of dissent. And this, the excerpt that was published in 1936 remains virtually the same in, his, in the 1941 book. Further evidence that Cash in the night, during the 1930s was making connections between the South and Nazi Germany is scattered throughout his journalism from the Charlotte News. In these pieces, Cash often discusses Nazism with references to the South, but not the other way around, though of course the, in, the connection is implied. In one such example from 1940, with perhaps an eye turned back to the Old South, Cash wrote that Nazi Germany was turning Poland into a slave state. And he predicted in an eerily prescient observation that workers might soon be branded for identification and sentenced to concentration camps and death if they resisted the Nazi rule. There's actually a fairly simple explanation why Cash was writing about Germany in terms of the South and not vice versa. When, when Cash went to work for the Charlotte News, um, apparently his, he, w he was assigned to write on national and international events, but not specifically about the South. Um, apparently his publisher um, did not like an essay that Cash had written in 1934 in another publication in which he examined the social life of Charlotte um, and found its citizens imprisoned by, in, by an ironclad conformity. Here's just this one sentence from um, that essay about the citizens of Charlotte. But the word come down, and they become simply a herd. Their idiosyncrasies and private convictions fall away, and they click into line like so many marionettes sliding through the grooves of the culture pattern, culture with a K, a German spelling, the culture spat pattern with all the inevitability of Hardy's dynas in the coils of the imminent will. And so you can see that even by 1934, Cash is envisioning the South as something deeply totalitarian and very scary. Not surprisingly, Cash's most forthright connection between Nazi Germany and the South came in his observations referencing the Ku Klux Klan as in his 1937 or editorial, Europe's Ku Kluxer, Ku Kluckers, in which he characterizes Hitler as a somewhat inferior Grand Dragon Clark, and the reference is to Edward Young Clark, one of the organizers of the Klan. In an editorial from 1940, Cash locates similar ideology structuring Nazi and Klan thinking, writing that both endorse, quote, racial hatred, intolerance, the belief that violence and brutality are justifiable because justifiable means of venting spite created by those emotions. Adding tremendous significance to this Nazi kind connection is the fact that Cash, as seen in Mine of the South, believed that Klan ideology 
was essentially that of the entire white South, not just members of the Ku Klux Klan. In what I find an absolutely remarkable passage, Cash describes the Klan metaphorically, this is from the mind of the South, as a body whose parts are made up of all white Southerners. This is Cash. The Klan's body was made up of common whites, industrial and rural, but its blood, if I may continue the figure, comes from the upper orders, and its bony framework and nervous system. The people who held it together and coordinated and directed it were very near to being coextensive with the established leadership of the South. People of great prominence in industry and business, indeed, were often, though not always, cherry about actually belonging to it, but they usually maintained liaison with it through their underlings and the politicians. And its ranks swarmed with little businessmen. Planters joined it by the wholesale, and more often than not worked with it when they did not join it. So did the landowning farmers generally. By the time Cash was making these observations, he had come to see, as had many commentators on the Nazis, including Dorothy Thompson, that Hitler was leading a revolt against civilization that threatened to plunge it, the West, into barbarism. For Cash, fascism and Nazism were not, as Anne Morrow Lindbergh claimed, the wave of the future, but instead a plummet into a dark past. And as such, they were the greatest menace to Western civilization to appear since the barbarian invasion, invasions which went on from the third to the ninth centuries. While other influences, uh, influences may have shaped Cash's central idea in the mind of the South, that the South never developed very far culturally because it was repeatedly thrust back into frontier conditions. Cash interpreted frontier very loosely, um, understanding it as, a, as any large-scale social upheaval that impedes cultural advancement. His emphasis on the South's violent barbarism almost certainly derives from his fears of, anti, of the Nazis' anti-civilizational violence. In a 1940 edi editorial, Cash characterized Hitler as a wild hog that at times emerged out of the forest to wreak havoc, all the while grunting of its virtue. The image, the feral razorback, is straight out of frontier, southern frontier icon iconography. Whatever its claims to be in the land of equal opportunity for all, Cash writes in the mind of the South that the frontier is actually typically given to cunning, to hoggery and callousness, to brutal, unscrupulous, and downright scoundrelism. In practice, on any frontier which holds out large prospects, and where accordingly men congregate in numbers, where events move swiftly and competition is intense, there inevitably arises the schemer, the creator of fictitious values, the adept in spurring on the already heated mind of his followers, and in his train, a whole horde of swindlers and cheats. Cash's words here could just as easily be describing Hitler and his power in Nazi Germany. Almost certainly, too, Cash's obsession with Hitler provided him with his term for the crushing power of Southern conformity. He oddly calls it the savage ideal, which he famously noted was established during Reconstruction, quote, as it had not been established in any Western people since the decay of feudalism, and almost as truly as it is established today in fascist Italy, in Nazi Germany, in Soviet Russia, and so paralyzed Southern culture at the root. Cash describes the power of the savage ideal as both tribal and totalitarianism. This is Cash again. Here under the pressure of what was felt to be a matter of life and death was the old line between what was Southern and what was not, etched as it were in fire and carried through every department of life. Here were the ideas and loyalties of the apotheosized past, fused with the, into the tightest coherence and endowed with all the binding emotional and intellectual power of any tribal complex of the Belgian Congo. Here was the mighty frame of the Democratic Party. The South had a one-party system, essentially, 
as potent as any instrument of regimentation, as any totemic society that ever existed. In a word, here explicitly, in a word here explicitly defined in every great essential, defined in feeling down to the last detail, was what, was what Southerners must think and say and do. Designating totalitarian conformity of savage points to Cash's idea that totalitarian, it, totalitarianism is best understood as a fall into barbarism. A plunge he expressed, he saw, found expressed in Kurtz's dying words in Conrad's Heart of Darkness, the horror, the horror. Cash entitled a 1940 book page essay about Conrad. Time shows Conrad knew the real Germany. As with Proto Dorian, Cash with the savage ideal coins a new phrase, perhaps believing that a new vocabulary was needed to comprehend the Nazi enterprise. Cash here was almost certainly following the lead of Dorothy Thompson again. In her 1936 column entitled Political Dictionary, Thompson observes that, quote, the fascist dictatorships have a special dictionary of their own, and that in negotiating with the fascist, Western democracies, quote, need a translator, not only from one language to another, but from one psychology to another. Morality in the language of all dictatorships, Thompson adds, means not devotion to an abstract standard of contact, conduct, but blind obedience to the dictates of the state. Unity in fascist terms means uniformity. Freedom of conscience means insubordination. Coordination means coercion. Wanting no such confusion in the mind of the South, Cash translates Nazi conceptions into words of his own making, thereby making sure that there will be no slippage in meaning. Cash's coining new terms was merely one strategy in his attempt to unmask the South's authoritarian structures. As seen in almost all his journalism exposing the horrors of Hitler and the Nazis, Cash believed that the only way to reveal the South's authoritarian structures was with clear-headed critical analysis. The tools he uses are precisely those that he saw Southern culture was seeking to suppress. What Cash identified as, quote, criticism, analysis, detachment, all those activities and attitudes so necessary to the healthy development of any civilization. However, for a Southerner to follow Cash's lead, he adds, took on the aspect of high treason. Little wonder that Cash was particularly anxious about the reception of the mind of the South in his homeland and perhaps why shortly after its publication he departed for Mexico, having finally won a Guggenheim Fellowship. And perhaps the most telling example of the furious response to the mind of the South came in a review essay by the conservative writer Donald Davidson, <clears throat> in which Davidson imagines himself leading a lynch mob debating whether to kill Cash. And in the, in the essay review, the, the lynchers decide not to lynch Cash um, because he's a white, because he's a white Southerner. Ironically, another instance that only confirms Cash's proto-Dorianism. But Mexico had its dangers. Cash knew well, as can be seen throughout his journalism, that Nazi Germany had its eyes on Central and South America, and that, a number of Latin, that in a number of Latin countries, including Mexico, extensive rings of Nazi spies were at work. And in fact, not long after his arrival in Mexico City, and shortly after the publication of The Mind of the South, Cash committed suicide, convinced that Nazi spies were pursuing him. There's no evidence that, the, that there were any Nazi agents after Cash, though one can easily imagine why Cash might have thought so, given his voluminous anti-Nazi journalism and what he saw as his anti-Nazi ideology that structured the mind of the South. As a close reader of Mein Kampf, Cash knew well that Hitler repeatedly and viciously attacked anti-Nazi journalists and called for their silencing. This is not to argue that Cash fell into madness entirely because of, of his obsession with Hitler and the Nazis. His long-term medical and psychological problems are well documented. But it is to say 
that that obsession had a part in his psychological unraveling and his death. Indeed, it is a crushing and terrible irony that the man who repeatedly called for clear-sighted and rational analysis for understanding the menace of Nazi Germany and also the American South, in the end succumbed to his own irrationality, his fall into madness, a version writ small of the madness towards which he feared Hitler and the Nazis were leading Western civilization. It is precisely this it is precisely, and I would say appropriately, this madness that he references in the final lines of the mind of the South. After identifying himself as a loyal son of the South because he was trying to make it better, and expressing hope that the South's virtue would over time conquer its faults, he concludes with these words. But the future I shall venture, but of the future I shall venture no definite prophecies. It would be a brave man who would venture them in any case. It would be a madman who would venture them in the face of the forces sweeping over the world in the fateful year of 1940. Thank you.